Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. It's This Weekend Startups, the startup of the week, brought to you by Walker Carpet Law. And we have a great, great, great startup on. It's Muckrack, um, which is like LinkedIn for journalists. It's really amazing. It's going to be an amazing program. There's a lot to learn about how they're marketing the product, how they built it, and really what you can do with it. It's, it's very powerful. Go check out muckrack.com and stick with us. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, the host of This Week in Startups. Thanks for tuning in to our program, episode number 7,472. Yes, it feels like I've done the show for 7,000 episodes at this point, but I tell you, I love it. And 2013 has been a great year uh, for all of us here at the team. We're getting so much recognition from the fans of the show. People are harassing Kim.com. They're tweeting Elon Musk. They're yelling at Mark Cuban on Twitter. Why haven't you been on the program? And I love that. I love you crazy super fans. I do. And I love doing the show this week in startups. And what I love most about the show um, is getting to meet great entrepreneurs, getting to see great products, and also hearing from people. They have been inspired and they've learned something from the show. I think that last part is really... The part that I find the most inspirational is when you guys come up to me at a party, at the club, at a casino, anywhere, down the street, in a McDonald's. I wouldn't be in a McDonald's, but, you know, whatever it is. You guys come up to me and you say, hey, J. Cal, I love the program. I've learned so much. And, God, that just that hits me right, right, in, right in the heart. Boom. And uh, it keeps me motivated to do the show and to keep learning along with you guys. This is the show about entrepreneurship. This is the show about putting a dent in the universe. This is not the show about picking rice, about having a modest, average life. This is the show about kicking ass. So, if you would like to have an average life, please tune out and go turn your TV on and watch some network garbage. But, if you'd like to have an epic life, if you'd like to crush it, if you would like to break new ground, if you would like to be one of the people contributing to society, then subscribe, tune in, uh, and join us on this journey, which we take every episode to learn uh, and to get inspired. And I couldn't do this show without um, the support of the partners. And one of those great partners is Scott Walker. Scott's a great guy. I've known Scott for a couple years now. And he has a great boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs, a.k.a. founders, a.k.a. people putting a dent in the universe. And all of his lawyers have a decade or two or more uh, of experience. And, you know, some of them have worked at those big firms that cost a lot of money. But no, uh, Scott's for firm is not going to bankrupt you. No, he's got this boutique firm which has lower overhead and he can pass that on to you, the frugal entrepreneur. And let me tell you, frugality is a key, key trait of great entrepreneurs. He encourages fixed fees and he believes that billable hours reward inefficiency. If you want to talk to the founder, founder to founder, Scott Walker can be reached directly at 310 288 Six 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 seven again. Three one zero two eight eight six 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 seven. Three one zero two eight eight six 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 seven. Walker Corporate Law. Walker Corporate Law dot com. What a great boutique law firm. And Scott, you can just follow at Scott Ed Walker uh, on Twitter. Really great guy. Really great firm. I hear nothing but great things from the people who've used him. And he controls costs like nobody else. And you want to put as much. And he understands this. You want to put every dollar you can into building your product. And actually, we're going to see a great product today. Um, that has a lot of dollars put into it um, and is incredibly efficiently put together. Uh, I've known Greg Gallant, I don't know, he'll tell me how long we've known each other, but for a while. And he's done a bunch of different projects um, with uh, Sawhoss Media, including the Shorty Awards you may have heard of, which is like the best of social media. He did Listorious, which was that um, you know list uh, influencer search engine back in the day, Venture Maven which is sort of the investor version of his current project. Uh, and he used to do the Venture Voice podcast. So he, he's, been, he's been bouncing around, but I think he's finally found what I call founder market or founder product match with his latest product, Muck Rack, which I think is just absolutely awesome. And uh, welcome to the program, Greg. How you doing? So much for having me. It's great to uh, great to be on from coast to coast. I know you're in Silicon Alley, my old haunt. And uh, I don't. know, When did we meet? God, a decade ago. 
Yeah, you know, I think it, I think it was 2005. It was like right after I graduated college and started Venture Voice back uh, yeah. in the early podcast days. Ah, uh, yes, the early podcast days. And so far, we ha- so so far, it's all come. Actually, YouTube has really just exploded the whole medium, and I've seen a bunch of interesting companies in that space. But uh, let's uh, let's talk about the new product, Muck Rack. What is it? Why did you build it? Sure. So Muckrack, it's a social network both for journalists to connect with each other and manage their presence and for companies to find the right journalists to talk to. And we, uh, we, we kind of stumbled across all this by accident. I'd signed up to Twitter early on and I got uh, at Gregory, uh, which I'm sure you can appreciate as a fellow member of the First Name Club. Yes, there's very few I- of us. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd only signed on to it early on because I had Ed Williams on my show back when he was working on this really hot startup, Odeo, which, of <laughs> course, you know, went nowhere. And I um, remember watching Twitter launch, and, yeah, I saw TechCrunch panned it. Uh, yeah, I was really curious, and I'd stayed in touch with Ev a little bit, both being in the podcast space. So I signed up to Twitter early on. Didn't get it at all. I logged out. Thank God, you know, there was no influence for Gregory to take away my username back then. And as I noticed, like people were starting to create really interesting content on Twitter in a way that they weren't on, uh, you know, really any other social network that was just about connecting with other people. Right. So as a joke, we created this thing called the Shorty Awards, where we just built a website, told people to nominate each other. So you could just write, I nominate at Jason for a Pound Technology Shorty Award. Put up the website. We had um, no intentions of really doing an event around it. But within 24 hours, it became the top trending term on Twitter. And so really quickly, we're like, okay, what's going on here? But then what really uh, took us aback and what was kind of the first inkling of what led us to Muckrack was that we saw that there were all these journalists on Twitter using it not just as a way to announce where they're eating lunch, but actually to do their job to find sources, find things to write about. They were using it for work. They were using it for work, exactly. Sourcing, and they were really the, research. the first profession to do that. Uh, and, and so you so build we, Muckrack. Um, so what is Muckrack? Explain what it is. It's a social sure, yeah, network, so, it's a database. What would you describe it as? <laughs> I would say, in a way, it's, you know, Sri uh, Sarvashinik, Columbia Journalism School wrote about us and seen that he described it as a LinkedIn for journalists, which I, I think is an interesting way to think about it, even though it's not where we started. But basically, it's, it's kind of a network that uses all the other social networks, but focused around journalists. And journalists use it to maintain their identity, connect with their colleagues, and then uh, businesses can use it to connect with journalists. So, I right. wouldn't so there are other it. services out there like this. There's Vocus, V-O-C-U-S, Vocus.com, and there's another one. Um, what's the other major? Uh, maybe pl- if you're thinking of Vocus, probably Cision would be considered their Cision is competitor. their big competitor. And these are services that cost, what, per month to have a database of journalists? Uh, the, the numbers I hear, they start about three to five thousand dollars a year, and they're they're kind of you know old school. You call them up and you get a license. Actually, Cision started as Bacon's book, which has been around since 1850. Right. So it's a uh, it's an old industry. Yeah, and so people pay for like whatever you know five thousand a year for a Vocus or a Cision, and they can just basically dump a bunch of emails out. And then, you know, in the worst case scenario, spam a bunch of journalists. In the best case scenario, intelligently target them and email them uh, with a great targeted brand. But people really have had um, a bad experience in some cases with those two services, do you think? Yeah, you know, I think the, the challenge is that they make it really easy to just grab a bunch of emails. And they really are in the pure sense of the word uh, databases or, you know, could just as easily be a book. So what happens is, you know, for every good PR person, a lot of PR firms, even big PR firms that charge a lot of money, just tell an intern, okay, here's your, you know, here's your account to this database, download a bunch of emails, pitch journalists, and it's just, there's no cost to pitching a thousand journalists at once for them, yeah. except in the long run, their reputation's the cost, so it's a huge cost. Yeah, but and people want to get out of the database uh, yeah, as quick as possible. Yeah, it leads to a lot of uh, spamming. 
So here's what I, here's what you can do with the product. I'll, I'll uh, fill in a couple blanks for people. But I went into the product, and I just did a search for a publication. I picked up Pando Daily, right? Sarah Lacey's awesome new uh, product. And here you see an overview with the most followed members of the staff. Obviously, Sarah Lacey with 68. Uh, Farhad Manju, uh, Slate columnist with 31. Paul Carr, 12. Adam Penenberg, 7. Aaron Griffin, Griffith, seven, you know, et cetera. And you go right down the line of, I guess, anybody who's ever contributed. Now, how did you build that list? Did you, is that a manual process that you guys went in and said, we've identified these people who contribute to Pando Daily? Yeah, it's, it's all a manual process. We have three different ways of building the database. The biggest one is that journalists come to us and request to be on there. We've already had uh, almost 10,000 journalists who've now requested to be a part of Muckrack. And it's largely because we started really early in the Twitter world back in 2009. So if, if you're a journalist and you want to know, hey, which of my colleagues at Pando Daily or New York Times are on Twitter, the best place to go has always been Muckrack. So that's the biggest. The second biggest is we work with a lot of social media editors at these uh, big publications. And they'll send us lists of journalists and sometimes have us in to do trainings with their journalists. And then finally, we have a team of editors who will do proactive outreach and add in journalists that we're missing. And so here I'm editing my profile. Sometimes I write um, for uh, Pando Daily or Business Insider, and obviously I do uh, stuff for the Launch Festival, which I'm not sure if that's in there. No, it's not. Silicon Alley, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, this week in startup should be in there. No, it's not. Okay, but anyway, I can put in different things I've contributed to, and then people will see me after you guys uh, approve it, that I will write for some of those places, correct? Yeah, exactly. The, the kind of way that Muckrack works now is any journalist can have a profile on, on the page, but to be listed in the directory, that's something that's hand verified by our team of editors. So when you look at Pando Daily, you know those are all journalists who really work there. So if you were searching for, let's say, Pando Daily, you could immediately find all the journalists at Pando Daily. And then if I can cl I click on, let's say, Paul Carr, a friend of mine, I can see his tweets. I can see, you know, what he's working on here. And I can add him to, I could put private notes here like, you know, um, ping him when in Vegas next time. And I guess that's a private note to me, like an intranet. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of like your own personal CRM. And I could add him to a, uh, a list so I could say snarky, uh, <laughs> snarky tech journalists. That's a great list. I wonder how many other of those exist on Muckrack right I now. I don't know how many. But so then I could go, uh, and now if I want to pitch him, this is where it gets interesting, correct? I can pitch him through the system? That's right. Well, you can pitch. This is a new feature we're testing. It's, we only opened up uh, the ability for journalists to customize their own profile mm -hmm. about three months ago. So if it's a journalist who happens to have signed up in the last three months, you can do it. Hmm. So I'm not sure if Paul has, but if you go back to Pando and let's say you click on Erin uh, Griffith, she'd be a good example to demo that uh, functionality with. So instead of me emailing her, I can click on Erin here and I can say, um, here's her portfolio, her interview, et cetera, and here there's Pitch Erin. So if I click Pitch, uh, it says what she covers, and I say this pitch is about, and it's the list of things she covers. So I say startups. And, and more importantly than what she covers, she also lists what she doesn't cover. Right, 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 right. So you can see she used to work at Ad Age, so she was still getting all these awful pitches on advertising case studies. So she specifically says what she doesn't. Yeah, and then here, the headline, why do you think I would be interested in the story of the pitch? Keep to 300, and uh, you just check off a little box here that says, hey, I'm not spamming her. <laughs> and so that, you think, is throttling and retargeting and maybe making PR a little bit more targeted. Is that the idea? Exactly. I mean, I think we're really doing um, you know, two things that's really important. One, one is we're just making sure that you're doing it one-to-one -one and you're doing your research. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we're forcing brevity. And we actually we knew that we wanted to limit the characters. We took the idea from David Pogue, who'd gotten all these awful pitches from PR people, told them to recast it in 300 characters, and then he said it was pretty good because they had to take out all the jargon and CEO quotes and all the, the junk that was in the press release. Ah, interesting. Um, what's really interesting also, you have beats. So here I can say Metro Los Angeles, and if I look at Metro Los Angeles, 
you've said these are all the journalists in, who cover Metro Los Angeles from KTLA or Fox LA or NBC or whatever it happens to be. But then I also see what are the most buzzed about, I'm assuming, stories? Yeah, that's right. So what this figures out, and the newsroom does it with all journalists, and what you're looking at now does it with just the journalists within the beat that you're on, it kind of takes a Reddit-like algorithm and figures out what are the journalists on this beat tweeting about the most right now. And so this is kind of a, a beautiful mix of human and um, technology curation, where it's the human creation to figure out who gets listened to and then the technology is always figuring out what are they talking about right now. Yeah. And so here, um, Southwest adds new feed aboard earlier, and you have an L.A. business columnist, um, UT of San Diego, a bunch of different people, assistant editor at the L.A. Times, all commenting on this. So I think the interesting thing here is if I was trying to integrate myself into this L.A. Times ecosystem as a PR person or a CEO... I could just go down here and start favoriting or retweeting these journalists that I don't even know about or writing interesting, intelligent comments back to them and building a true one-to-one -one relationship again, correct? That's a great point. That, that's exactly what we try to encourage you to do, and that's why all the Twitter intent buttons are there, so you can do it straight through Muckrack. And I think it raises a larger point, which is a lot of people are used to they're used to starting the relationship with the journalist when they want to do the pitch. And if you're good, you can make that work. But it's much better, as you're pointing out, to get yourself on the radar so that when you do actually have news break, people know who you are and you've kind of built the well before you're thirsty. Uh, what's really interesting about that is I see somebody here talking about the BlackBerry 10, which I just played with uh, recently before it came out. And so I could then email back to the person um, the story about me uh, talking about it. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. So now I, I'll show you what I'm doing here. This is like how to do intelligent PR in the, uh, you know, the new millennium. Let me see if I can find it. What did I just do with that screen? Huh. Ah, here we go. Oh, you know what? I just hit reply. Oh, there it is. So here I hit replied to somebody who's talking about BlackBerry 10, who's a journalist, who I don't even know who this person, Salvador Rodriguez, is. But I just say, I play with last week. It's amazing. Um, and then I tweet it, and now that person who writes for the New York Times and LA Times and other places, I can click follow to follow them, and they just got two signals that, hey, somebody is uh, intelligently interacting with you, correct? That, that's exactly it. And, and the fascinating thing with many of these journalists is even though they might have tremendous influence to write something that will be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or you know, be read by millions of people online. They don't necessarily have a tremendous number of Twitter followers, so many of them really do pay attention to the at replies and who's following them, and, and you have that kind of golden opportunity right now. Are journalists more desperate these days? They seem to have the upper hand, you know, whatever it was, 10 years ago, but now it seems like because they've been charged with not only writing a great story, but being a great promoter of their stories, the, the dynamics change, right? There's a certain quid pro quo going on in, the, in journalism, would you say? Well, it, the dynamics definitely changed where, you know, I think the really powerful thing that that's changed even between when we first met is that now everyone's using the same platform. So I'm using, you and I are using the exact same platform that, uh, you know, the most powerful journalists are using to be able to you know, share their stories, get their sources. And because of that, after they write a story, there, there's a big question like, hey, will the person I'm writing about tweet this? Because that'll actually make a difference in how distributed it is. And you know, before this, who cared if the person who, uh, who you wrote about shared the article with their 10 friends or even emailed it to 50 people they knew? Yeah, I mean, it seems like now I, I've frequently been um, I don't know if I've been outright asked, but I've had journalists say, hey, here's the story, um, you, know, uh, you know, wouldn't complain if you tweeted it to your 160,000 followers, right? So there is a little sort of underground bartering going on, I believe, between journalists and, you know, big subjects, let's say. Well, there always been, right? I mean, 2020 or 60 Minutes is going to get a big guest, or, or Howard Stern or whoever it is, they're going to treat him a certain way in order to get their cachet. Yeah, sure. I mean... 
like you were saying, it's it's always going on where you know if you if you trash somebody, they're not going to give you the next scoop, or they're not going to speak at your conference, or they're not going to uh, you know give you the access you want. Like Apple played that card decades yeah. ago, but but in a way, I guess like you're saying, it's that quid pro quo or the, those little bargains, they're now kind of transparent in a way that they used to not be. Now, you're doing a couple of interesting things to build your community, which I, I think are tremendously savvy. Um, the two that stick out is there's a daily email that you send of the top stories that all the journalists in the world are talking about. And I have to say, it's must read. Explain what is that daily email and how is it created? Sure. So it's called the Muckrack Daily. It's, it's extremely old fashioned. And I'm glad to see you have the, uh, the mail chimp, chimp on your desk because you used to send it. Is that how you send it? Uh, yeah, it is. Oh, great. And, uh, you know, it's funny with MailChimp, it's one of those companies I love where he signed up for it back, you know, when it was a $10 a month decision, and now we pay them a lot more. Yeah. But, um, so tell so me, what's, how does that email work? Who writes that, and, and, and how many people get it? Yeah, so we started that back in 2010. The idea was when we started the site, there were 10,000, or there were 150 journalists on Twitter we found. Now there's over 10,000. So... Muckrack Daily is written by a human every morning using Muckrack. So it's kind of like the hour you should be spending every morning figuring, using Muckrack and figuring out what journalists are talking about, she does for you. Hmm. She writes it every day, goes out to over 10,000 uh, loyal readers, uh, has had a, uh, a very high engagement rate. And it's been kind of a surprise to us that when I go around it, for many people, it's their favorite part of Muckrack, and it's the way that they know us because the, the Daily came before Muckrack Pro and a lot of the other things that you're showing off today. And it's just been um, kind of a really powerful way to unite the industry. Yeah, it seems to be like you're writing about them, therefore it's interesting to them, and it's their colleagues, etc. Now, the stories journalists are talking about is the newsroom, and this is where it's really interesting. Do you have any evidence that, say, CNN or any other top news organizations, New York Times, are monitoring this? Because it seems to me that if journalists are buzzing about something, then it has reached a certain, you know, if you've scientifically figured out what journalists are buzzing about, they have a certain benchmark. Therefore, it's like, it's almost like it's proto news, like this uber, super powerful news, correct? Yeah, yeah, we've actually heard from uh, several media companies that they're using the Muckrack homepage now to, uh, to kind of figure out what to cover. And, it, and it's a way of getting like instant verif verified views on a story, too, where even if you already know that the story exists, by looking at it in the newsroom, you can say, okay, what are 30 verified journalists saying? And what are the people at the New York Times saying? What are people at the Wall Street Journal saying? And ah, got so that's even better. It's like you're getting, not only you're getting that this Michelle Obama uh, throws a world historical shade at John Boner, um, but you get the fact that somebody from The Verge, somebody from Salon, somebody from KPCC, uh, et cetera, are commenting on it. Exactly. And it's important because, you know, what, what if that's a hoax? Like we saw during Sandy where there was all this media being shared and, you know, who knows, is that a, you know, a video that just happened to Michelle Obama, or is it something from, you know, four years ago? I mean, here I'm sure it's verified, but if I wanted to be sure, I could say, okay, well, you know, these 50 journalists have signed their name to it, so that's a, a strong signal, just like if you're verifying any, uh, you know, any other piece of content. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So um, how much, I mean, the other services are charging $5,000 a year for this or something. And this seems more powerful to me. How much are you um, charging for it? Yeah, so, um, you know, unlike a lot of the other services in the area, we just list all of our pricing on our website, just muckrack.com. Oh, there's plan. a little zing. <laughs> <laughs> unlike the and competitors, which hide their prices <laughs> because they change them based on who you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're different eras, too. I don't, I don't hold it against those guys, but... Uh, oh, I hate that stuff. If, you should hold, you do hold it against uh, them. What is it? Muckrack slash? Plans. Oh, plans. Okay. I'll and you can up. see it starts at uh, about 100 bucks a month, $99 a month per user yep. for the entry plan, which, you know, and we have anybody using it from like, you know, one person startups where like this is cheaper than getting a, uh, a PR firm for, you know, 10 grand a month. But yeah. then we also have huge PR firms using it and huge companies using it too. Yeah. No, we've been using it here and um, just to, really just 
uh, interact socially with journalists, uh, with Mahalo's YouTube shows, Inside.com's YouTube shows, and it's very powerful. For example, I have a I have a uh, alert set. You can set alerts with the system for the searches, and so we have a bunch of cooking shows. So I just set up a cooking alert. And just showed it to the the producer of that those cooking shows we're doing, like Inside My Kitchen and Food Deconstructed and Recipe Wars, all these shows. And boy, is it powerful to see an alert for all the journalists who are talking about cooking or recipes or the stuff. You just can start favoriting and interacting with them and then maybe get a story. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to use it. And we found, to our surprise, like the alerts, which was kind of a uh, an afterthought when we were building it, has become one of our, our users' favorite features. And it's largely because you know everyone's busy, and especially if you're an entrepreneur and you're doing a million things, you uh, you know you just forget to do PR, but getting like that daily email like, hey, here's 50 journalists you should be talking to really uh, you know keeps you going with it. One of the things I like a lot is that when something is um, inside of a story, not just in the tweet, but in the full text of the article, you're indexing that in your search engine as well. So if I was looking for, say, doing a vanity search for my last name, Calacanis, mm -hmm. when 15.5 had their announcement last week that they, um, you know, 15.5 uh, put out the announcement that they had received investment, or in this case, um, talking about the iPad Mini and the Galaxy Note, which I did a piece on last week, I'm not actually in this person's tweet from the Orange County Register, I'm in the story that he tweeted, correct? That's right, yeah. We, we put a lot of work into this where we don't only pull in the social media content, but as you point out, we index the full article that they're linking to. So in a way, it's like we're, you know, we're kind of indexing the whole web through the eyes of journalists. Hmm. And because of that, you can type in much more specific terms. And that's kind of the biggest learning curve with Muckrack is people, People are used to going to a service like this and typing in a very general term, like you know you're in uh, you know like just web TV or startups. But the power of it is that you could type in your name, your company's name, your competitors, and you're actually going to get results because we just have so much data to search through. Yeah, it's interesting. You type in like Sequoia Capital, and here the first one is this radio app tuning got 60 million in funding from the Charlotte Observer. Uh, or was tweeted by the Charlotte Observer, and it's from a story in uh, what publication? All Things D. But you would never know that Sequoia Capital was mentioned by that person, except that it was inside the story. So it's another brilliant feature, um, and the design is great. So you seem to be a distracted entrepreneur. So many different um, <laughs> things you've started. Is this the last one, and do you shut the other things down to consolidate to focus on this? Because I feel like this is the big winner. Yeah, this one I really, you know, so so we we did a lot of experimentation with. Uh, Sawhorse Media, and uh, as you were pointing out, it, you know, in addition to the sites you mentioned, we launched about a dozen. Um, many, many of them do using a similar platform to Muckrack, and we found that this was the vertical. It was the first one we launched, the one that worked the best. So it's got uh, like 80% of my attention right now, and then we we also continue to run the uh, the Shorty Awards, which pairs nicely because we use Muckrack to do the PR and there's a lot of PR for the Shorty Awards, and then we also give out a Journalist Shorty Award as part of it. Um, but aside from that, we decided like we took Listorious and Venture Maven. I mean, they, they still exist, but we put absolutely zero uh, effort into them, and decided, okay, you know, this one it's a uh, it's a huge market. It can help everybody from a Fortune 500 to a one-person startup. And then the whole kind of world is shifting where, you know, in a way, everyone's going to share some attributes with the journalist pretty soon, if not already. So we just want to, you know, get this right and really make it big. Well, listen, it's a fantastic service. I'm totally enamored with it, and I think you're going to have great success. Um, if uh, you would like to check it out, go ahead and go to muckrack, M-U-C-K-R-A-C-K.com. And if I'm just a civilian, can I use the service at all? Can I just use the search feature, or do I have to pay to use it? So it, it's a freemium product. So what anybody can do for free is view the main newsroom. Mm. You can get the daily email for free. So the, the general idea <clears throat> is, and you can even set up a profile for free. Even if you're not a journalist, you can use mm. it to keep your portfolio. So the big idea is if you just want to know what journalists are talking about in general, you can use Muckrack for free, muckrack.com. And then if you, um, you want to use Muckrack to get more press, 
that's where Muckrack Pro comes in, just muckrack.com slash pro or muckrackpro.com, and mm -hmm. that's where you can sign up and really use it as you've just been outlining. So, yeah, if you want to search and get and drill down, you got to pay at least 99 bucks a month. Which, are journalists signing up for the pro, and or is there, or do you give journalists a pro for free? We give journalists pro for free. Ah. But you know the journalists, uh, you know, they don't have any money, it's not... Yeah. They don't have a big expense account, so we figured let's just give everything to the journalists for free and then uh, you know, charge people who actually have money for the product. Well, I think you've made like a, a really like a, you've broken through as an entrepreneur and made something of real, true, true, discernible value that's got long-term value. I'm addicted to it. I love the product. Um, and I think that your marketing and the branding and everything is just really tight. So continued success with it, Greg, and uh, everybody follow at Gregory. G R E G O R Y. I don't know why I feel the need to spell that. I guess because sometimes people spell it differently. Uh, but uh, Greg Lant, CEO of Muckrack, thank you so much for being on the program. And special thanks to my friends at Walker Corporate Law for sponsoring uh, the Startup of the Week. And uh, what else, Greg? Any other plugs? Yeah, let's see. Well, well thanks so much for having me. Yep. If, uh, if anyone loves a, a journalist or if anyone wants to nominate Jason, they should head over to shortyawards.com. And we're also just launching a fun new little feature that uh, is part of Muckrack, but you can get to it at whosharedmylink.com if you want to see how many people shared any given link that you, uh, that you have. Yeah, I just had this up on the screen. Let me see. Whosharedmylink.com. So I can go to whosharedmylink.com, put in a link. I think I just had one here. So if I put in this one... Uh that I played with somebody's black, or maybe, I don't know if anybody retweeted that, no. Oh, it says 32 people did tweet it, but it's not a story from the uh, thing, but you'll see what journalists uh, and how many people tweeted and stuff. It's a pretty powerful thing, um, so I suggest everybody check that out as well. Um, everybody go to muckrack.com. Really great product, really great entrepreneur, and I'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups.